to the book of Joel, chapter 3. As you turn there, I'll share with you part of the thought that's on my heart for us tonight. Uh, I had the, uh, the blessing a couple of weeks ago. Callie turned 15 years old, and uh, her, her wish for her birthday party, what she wanted was, or for a birthday gift, was a hike down the Appalachian Trail. And so a couple weekends ago, we went down the Appalachian Trail, walked just short of 20 miles um, around the, the forests of North Georgia. And I knew um, going up there several weeks in advance, you know, I'm, I'm not as young as I used to be. I'm definitely not in any kind of shape. And so I was praying going up there. I knew going up there that I, Callie, my three nieces, and Clayton and I, that I was going to be in the back of the line the whole time, especially climbing up those mountains. I was going to be in far back in the line. When we finally got the last day down to the car, Clayton and I both were kind of huffing and puffing, but those four girls, they clapped their hands. Yay, these old men made it. But, <laughs> but in preparation, um, I should have done some conditioning is what I should have done. But what I did do, knowing that I was going to be in the back of the line, is I took some time to pray, pray that God would give me just some, some conversation over the course of those three days, that he would talk to me. And I had some questions that I've laid out before him, and and uh, over the course of those three days, God indeed did that with me. It was good to meet God on that trail and to hear what he had to say. And part of my thought tonight is just to share with you some of what God spoke to me about on that particular night, or on that particular trail, rather, on those particular days. And so I'm going to start, though, in the book of Joel, chapter 3. Here in the book of Joel, there's a particular just one verse that I want us to look at in this passage of Scripture to set our, our thoughts in the right direction. So Joel chapter 3, look with me at verse 14. Verse 14 says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now what I'm after, there are several messages that could be preached out of that one particular verse, but what I'm after is this understanding that there is a a valley that's there, and multitudes, multitudes are in that particular valley of decision. There's times in our life where we are down in the valley, and God's Word gives us these beautiful word pictures of both the valleys of life, and we're going to look in a second at the mountains of life, and how out of both of those, how we need to exercise ourselves and prepare ourselves and be diligent in the walk that God has called us to walk in. Multitudes, multitudes in this valley of decision. The valleys in God's Word often represents those low points in our life where we're in some kind of struggle or a hardship or, or we've just have gone over one mountain and now we're going back down in the valley where it's also beautiful and, and, and peaceful and, and calm down in that valley. But the goal is never to stay in the valleys. The call of God is never for us to stay and spend all of our time in the valleys. It says in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. It's one of the things that God brought my attention to is, is oftentimes I get okay and I get comfortable being in the valley because I know that the Lord is with me even in the midst of the valleys. But God's not called me to stay in the valley alone, but to recognize He is my Lord and to follow the direction that He gives. And if I just stay in the valleys, I never experience the the good blessings and the great joys it is to be in greater fellowship with our Lord in my lifetime. And so it's not just to stay in the valleys, but oftentimes, as it's saying here in this passage of Scripture, multitudes, multitudes in that valley of decision, oftentimes we get comfortable in the valleys and we're indecisive, we're not committed, we're not steadfast to set our hands to the plow and the course that's laid out ahead of us and to begin to walk out of that valley up the sides of the mountains toward what God has for us in our days ahead. We whine and we complain and we get upset because we see the, the kind of work it's going to take to climb out of that valley and walk up that mountain. And so we build our houses and we make our places down in this valley of decision, never having fully committed ourselves to what God's got for us. And we don't need to stay there. But there's going to be many valleys in our lifetime. And in those valleys, we'll find those moments of darkness. But we'll also find always laid out in front of us that straight and narrow path. That if we follow what God has for us, we look to His Word, which is that light for us, then that valley is going to be short-lived as we walk that path that God brings us back up into 
a higher place of fellowship with him. So in that valley of decision, there's multitudes there. And the, the, the picture that I want you to get is leaving that valley and climbing the mountains. Now, whenever I was climbing the mountains with Callie, she was always the first one in the line, way ahead of us, better condition than the rest of us out there. Her cousin would say she was running up the mountain and, and uh, clicking her heels as she went. Uh, probably about a mile ahead of me. But as I would start up the mountain, you know, with a about a 35-pound pack on your back, <clears throat> the weight would get heavy, your legs would get shaky, and there was moments where you would think, okay, Lord, I'm not going to make it. Our second day on that particular hike, we'd gone about 10 miles or so on that particular day, and that last mile at the end of the day, we had been hiking and doing all things. The last mile to our campsite was a beautiful place. It was right, we camped out right beside a waterfall. We had dinner at the rocks at the base of the waterfall. We finally got there. Beautiful scene. We had a Bible study with the girls as they, we were sitting there doing dinner. But to get there, I had to climb this mountain. And I was exhausted with this pack on my back. My legs were shaking. My, whatever, my, my muscles in my legs were crying out, You haven't done this in years. What are you doing? I felt like crawling to get up the mountain. And I began to ask myself, okay, Am I going to make it? I took a lot of breaks and a lot of stops, but never once did I desire to go back down the mountain. My daughter was up on top of the mountain, so I had a reason for getting up there, but, but just in that simple illustration, my Lord is on top of the mountains for us as a people of God. There's no doubt in our minds, if we understand who Christ is, that it's worth climbing those mountains to get there. Because on the mountaintop is a greater experience of fellowship an understanding of who our Lord and our Savior is. The mountains He's given us in His Word, we turn our eyes into the hills from whence cometh our help is what it says in Psalms. Or in, in Hebrews 12, it talks about that particular... How does it say it? This is what it says, Hebrews 12, But you are come, you're not coming, eight, to verse 18 of Hebrews 12, to the mount that, may, that might be touched, that burned with fire, not unto blackness and darkness and tempest, but you are come, in verse 22, unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Think about what's on top of that mountain that God has placed for us. That if we would commit ourselves to climbing the mountain and we keep before us the vision of Christ as we walk that mountain to this Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the kingdom of God, where in it we sit down and we fellowship with the saints of God, and most preciously with Jesus Christ Himself. It makes the treachery, the, 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 tre the, the gruelingness, I can't find the word there, the hardship of that climb all worthwhile. It's easy to be distracted and think about the muscles that are cramping or the can't catch my breath or, you know, there was times where we would get to the top of a hill and you'd have that little moment of respite where you're walking along the ridge and you think that you're at the top of the mountain and then you circle the round the side of the mountain and you realize there's a whole lot more to climb and you think, oh, I just can't keep doing it, but it's worth every moment of the climb. And I want, to, I want you to think about it with me in, in some of these, these places. Let's go first to Matthew chapter 21. I want you to turn there with me. Matthew chapter 21. And what I want to do is just reflect on a couple of the statements that Jesus makes or the scenes around Jesus with the mountains that are there. Matthew chapter 21. Let's start in verse 18. The word reads, Now in the, in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on, the, on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. It's a marvelous thing to think about. Now the disciples saw this, verse 20, And when, they, when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? They're marveling at what they've just seen. This, this seems like an impossible kind of thing. What, what in the world's going on here? But listen to Jesus' response and what he says in verse 21. Then answered and said unto them, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also, if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. 
And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Now go there, and maybe this is more testimony on my part, but as you see this particular verse, Jesus saying, that if you shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed with, with that faith and without doubting, that that mountain would be removed. That's part of what God spoke to me on that particular mountain. I didn't ever think to ask God to actually move the, the mountains. I thought a few times, Lord, help make it flat. I need to walk on some calm ground for a while. But especially that first day, one of the steeper hills that we were climbing, and I was realizing how unconditioned I was in, what the kind of condition I was in, unconditioned I was, the doubt began to seep into, seep into my mind. The first day, we had just gotten started. Lord, I already knew I was out of shape. Can I really make three days on this trip? And my prayer began not for God to remove the literal mountain, but the mountains in me of doubt and the mountains in me of confusion or the mountains in me of, of, of what Satan was saying to hold me back and to not help me to not know that I, have, I was walking in the strength and the power of the Lord, not just to climb a mountain, but to hear all the things that God had in store for me over the course of that weekend. I had gone with my heart's desire to hear the Lord speak to me. And on the very first mountain that I was climbing, Satan already there whispering in my ear, you cannot do this. And the mountain that that began to raise up in my heart that if I can't do this, I know that I won't be hearing what the Lord has for me to say. I walk back to my car and just sit in shame, embarrassment, but in defeat because I know that the Lord has something to say to me this weekend. And so I kept putting one foot in front of the other and asking God in me to remove those mountains of the doubt that was there. Remove those mountains of the frustration, even some of the, the, the breathing that I had going on. and the, my, my watch, I told him this morning, my, my watch kept telling me, okay, your heart rate's up too high. You know. I won't go through with you all the doubts and all the things that Satan was putting in my head, but I learned that day the, the reality of this verse is that if we ask without doubting and we ask in faith, the mountains that Satan puts in our life and the mountains that we hold up in our own hearts that seem insurmountable won't hold us back in those valleys of decision if we ask God to remove those mountains, that we might continue the climb that he has set before us. One of the neat illustrations is on that second day, we got to a certain trail and, and uh, Clayton's back was hurting and so we got to a, a, a crossroads in the Appalachian Trail and we decided to lay our packs aside for a while, those 35 pound bags, and come back to them. We were going to make a loop and come back to that particular juncture. And Do you know how much it was easier it was climbing that mountain without those 35 pound bags? We have come to Mount Zion, it says in Hebrews, and the first part of that chapter says, lay aside all the weights and the sin that does so easily beset you. Pray to God and ask Him to remove those mountains and those packs of weight and those things that keep you weighed down and set out on that race that's ahead of you. Climb the mountain that's ahead of you. Pray and ask without doubt, with faith, for God to remove the mountains that hold you back and that seem to weigh you down and to make you think, well, I can't get over that. I'm just going to stay. I'm going to hang out. Lord, I know you're with me in the valley, and so I'll just stay down here. It's not where God's called us to stay. Go over to Mark chapter 9. And I want to go to this passage of Scripture because of the way it words, it words it here in this passage of Scripture. But Mark chapter 9, this is where Jesus has taken Peter and John with Him. <coughs> excuse me, Peter, James, and John with Him up onto a mountain to pray. Mark chapter 9, begin with me in verse 1. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Now I'm going to pause there for a second, but we're going to keep reading. But what this verse is saying is Jesus has taken three of these particular disciples or apostles with him. And as he took them with him, he departed the rest of them, and he went up high into a mountain. Now, if we think just with the flesh for a second, just with the, the natural body, 
the highest mountain we climbed, I don't know, it had probably about a, a 35 degree, and it was about a, about two miles straight, two miles, it felt like straight up, you know, to me. But, but after two miles of that 30 to 35 degree angle on that, I was exhausted. And if you think with just the, the physical nature of who we are, God's calling me to go up on a mountain, high into a mountain with Him, and I allow the physical flesh, this weakness of the flesh, and the weakness of the mind to begin to dictate for me, Jesus, you just go on. I, I, I'm holding you back. You just go on without me. I'm just going to stand right here on the side of the mountain and I'll wait. What happens when we do that? What happened on that high mountain? When they went high up on the mountain, what happened there that James and Peter and John were blessed to experience? It says the end of verse 2, and he was transfigured before them. This is the Mount of Transfiguration of the story that we're at. But let's go on and read in verse 3. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Now imagine for a second if Peter had said, I'm just a fisherman. I don't climb mountains. I'm just going to hang out here. Jesus, you go on and I'll pray for you. You go on. James and John, y'all go on. I'll... What would Peter have missed out if he had said that? If he would allowed the mountains of the flesh and the doubt and the physical things hold him back down toward the valley of decision and not have gone up on that Mount of Transfiguration, he wouldn't have understood, Master, it is good for us to be here. I think all too often we, as a people of God, we know that God is with us in the valleys and so we remain in the valleys and we don't set out truly on that path, a straight and narrow path ahead of us. And, or when we do, we get weary and we get tired and we, we ache and so we we miss the goodness of where God or Jesus is taking us and what He's going to bless us to see and to experience with Him. It is through much tribulation. It is through much struggle in the flesh. And other people telling you, you don't have to, Jesus, God is right here with you in this valley of, of death. You don't need to fear any evil. But as we, we climb out of that valley and we march up that mountain and we set our hand to that particular direction, and we don't let the screaming muscles and the doubt and the, the, the uncomfortableness and all of these things of life hold us back, and we begin to get higher up in that mountain, we will see Christ in His whiteness and His glory and His goodness. Master, it is good for us to be here. I will say over the course of that weekend, particularly the, the, we circled around and came back to our car. We, we made a big circle. And going down that last particular, going up the hill, it wasn't a mountain that time. It was pretty, pretty easy. But going down that hill, one of my last thoughts was, you know, throughout the weekend or, or going into it, I had intended to try to stay up with Clayton. <laughs> I knew I couldn't with Callie. Clayton's about three or four years younger than me. I couldn't stay up with Clayton. He's far more good in physical condition than I am. But what God struck me going down that mountain that day was, God, it was, and I was praying that to God, God, it's been good. Thank you for talking to me this week. And that last thing he said is, I didn't call you, Clay, to keep up with other people. I called you to follow me. And as I followed him, not worrying about knowing I was going to be far behind, but not worrying about staying up with Clayton or with Callie or anything, God spoke throughout the course of that trip. And I met God on the sides of those mountains. And I met God down in the valleys, and I met God up on the tops of the mountains. And I'm so thankful that I kept at it over the course of the weekend. It's a, it's a silly, maybe natural illustration of the spiritual message that God has for us to not stay in the valley of decision, but to set out and climb the mountains of glory, to, to set out toward Mount Zion, which is on top of that mountain, the kingdom of God, and that heavenly Jerusalem and the temple of God and the seat of Christ himself where we sit down and we have fellowship with Jesus Christ. Let me keep reading right here. Verse 5 in Mark 9. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, 
One for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. Now Peter saw a marvelous thing. Elijah and, and Moses were dead. And here he is seeing them talk with, um, with Jesus Christ. In Peter's understanding, I don't think he was in error in understanding the marvelous thing that he was looking at. But, but Jesus corrected him. And that's like us. That's part of my thought here. On that trail of life, on that straight and narrow path that God has called us to serve and to walk on, there are all these side trails that are marvelous things, but God's not called us to get off on those trails and those tracks. They lead back down into valleys, and some of those trails lead into treacherous, difficult valleys where it's more certain for death and for harm and those kind of things to who we are spiritually. We're to stay on the, the path that's laid out for us. And that's what Jesus calls Peter back to the attention of as he says, as Peter in his understanding it says, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. For he knew not, he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly when they had looked round about, they saw no man anymore save Jesus only. And those last two words there, think about that. They saw Jesus only with themselves. Jesus said, come on with me. And he took them high up in a mountain. And there's all kinds of mountains in our mind and problems in the flesh that might have held us back from climbing the mountain. But because they climbed the mountain with Christ, not only do they have this miraculous experience with Jesus Christ, but at the end, even as Jesus is correcting, and they look up and the Father says, that this is my son, and they look up and they see Jesus with themselves. Isn't that a beautiful thought? The experience of the fellowship that we have with Jesus Christ is Jesus with us. He's not saying, go take that mountain, go climb that mountain. Jesus is saying, I'm with you every step of the way. And he shows himself to us and we see him more plainly as we climb the mountains that he's called us to climb. Now on the other side of the mountain, it's time for us to walk down and there'll be a valley in the bottom of that mountain. But the valleys are no place for us to take up residence and stay. There's another mountain for us to climb. And on top of that mountain, there's likewise a new experience and a new fellowship and a new learning that we'll have with Jesus Christ. But as we climb those mountains, we need to be praying without, with faith and without doubt, Lord, move the mountains of my life that have gotten in the way of me seeing that I can I am able to climb the mountain because you are with me every step of the way. And on top of that mountain, the glory of experiencing Christ and His kingdom new and afresh every day. I don't know how many mountains we actually climbed over the course of that weekend. I know there was Stringer Mountain, which is the beginning of the Appalachian Trail. There was Ball Mountain and there was Hightower Mountain. It felt like about ten mountains that we climbed. But if we just take those three, every one of those mountains... Had, when, when you got to the top, now on the, on the bottom, in the valleys, it was beautiful. The foliage and the, the leaves were turning red and yellow and they were falling on the ground and they covered everything, just absolutely beautiful. But when you get to the top of the mountain, there's this beautiful scene and this overlook that you can't drive to, you have to hike to. And you're looking at the scene of a string of other mountains in the distance for however many miles that you can see and it's clear. And on top of Ball Mountain, we were all exhausted and we... It was just a grassy knoll, pretty steep slope, and we all kind of laid there on the grass for a while and caught our breath and rested and looked out at the, the scene that was before us, and there was rest. And, and what I'm trying to get at there is that all throughout the course of the trip, myself, this unconditioned, physically out of shape individual, physically climbing mountains, experienced a God who met me every step of the way and spoke to me. And if we take that natural illustration and we apply it to every one of us in this life, whatever valley that we might be in, whatever hill we're trying to climb, or if we're on the top of the mountain at the moment, God is there helping us and with us every step of the way. And so as I, as I was thinking about this today and considering, so, so what is the practical application for you and I? I came to this. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Here in 1 Timothy, Paul, speaking to Timothy, giving him instruction under the spirit of, anointing of the Spirit of God 
on how to faithfully serve the people of God. There are going to be many mountains in Timothy's life, and there's going to be many valleys in Timothy's life, but there's going to be many hills that he's got to climb in the process of serving God's people. Now, Paul doesn't word it that way. He doesn't say there's going to be some, some steep hills that you've got to climb as you serve the people of God, but he warns him there's going to be some difficulties. And he says this to Timothy here in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look with me just at verse 7. It's the last part of verse 7 that I'm after. But the first part says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and, listen to what it says, Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Exercise, condition, discipline, work. Exercise yourself unto godliness. Let me go back for just a moment to the, the natural mountain as the illustration. Let me ask, when is it most important? When would it have been? I can't say when was the most important that I did because I didn't do it. When would it have been more important for me to have conditioned myself beforehand? When I was walking in the valleys? When I was walking on the top of the mountains? Or when I was climbing the mountain? The conditioning shows that it happened whenever you're climbing the mountain. When you're going through the most difficult part of the whole journey. When you're serving God in the most difficult points of life. That's when the conditioning shows itself most clearly. But when do you need to be conditioning? When should you start conditioning? I realized very quickly... Climbing that first mountain that day, now's not the time to start conditioning. I hope that I get some kind of conditioning out of the course of the weekend, but I should have been doing this for months before. And God asked me on that first mountain, one of the things that I heard God say to me was, if you're this out of shape physically, how out of shape are you spiritually, Clay? And unfortunately, there are several areas of laziness and selfishness that I've not exercised myself toward godliness. And as I, I face some of those mountains, spiritually, I look back and I see, I see a big mountain that I don't feel like I can overcome. My doubt is there. Or I think the valley would have been better to have stayed in. Or I pray God to flatten the mountain rather than to remove that mountain in me. God's called us to condition ourselves toward godliness. The conditioning doesn't happen just when we're climbing the steepest of the hills spiritually. It should be happening when we're in the valleys, when we're on the mountaintop, when we're walking down the other side of the mountain and we feel like it's easy, so that at all times we're prepared and ready as a child of God to climb whatever mountain might present itself today. And so the application for us as a people of God, as we think about the mountains and the valleys in our life, the hills to climb and the difficulties of climbing the hills, the rest and the beauty on top of the mountains, the fellowship and the intimacy with Christ, as we think about the valleys, and yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I want to fear no evil, for the Lord is with me. That at all times, without ceasing, we condition ourselves as the people of God to be able to hear His voice with His word, to be able to see the path that's laid out in front of us, and with the determination and the steadfastness that we might set out on that path and not look back, trusting and knowing in the promises of God that are there for us, in the valleys, and on the sides of the mountains, and in the hilltops. Master, it is good for us to be here. I pray that as you face the valleys and the mountains in your life this week, that likewise, one, that you condition yourself for that, but likewise you say as Peter did, Master, it's good for us to be here. We've seen good and great things. And we remember, as we look up and we see the clarity as we get to the top, Jesus is with us. That's my prayer for Christ's sake. Amen. When we walk